Gospel according to Luke. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And ahead he sent and sent messengers ahead of him. But on their way they entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because, well, his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and then he went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another man he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One Sunday morning at a Texas prison, a group of inmates were being led to the Catholic and the Protestant chapels. One prisoner, however, did not enter either chapel, but instead kept walking toward the main gate. A guard caught up, caught up with him and he asked, Just where do you think you're going? And the prisoner replied, I was told that I could go to the church of my choice. And the church of my choice is in Denver. Aren't we all just like that inmate? We all want our freedom, and we don't want anyone to take it away from us. For in freedom Christ has set us free. That's what Paul says right there in the second reading this morning. We Christians have been set free. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are free from the law as set out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Ah, but the question is, are we free to do our own thing? Are we free to live on the wild side? Because it doesn't matter what we do since we're all forgiven. Well, you know the answer to that. Of course not. Freedom from the law does not mean freedom to do your own thing. I mean, as Paul wrote, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. That means that to the Christian, freedom is not an opportunity for self-indulgence. You know, In a previous call of mine, I had a retired pastor in the congregation, and he was just an old curmudgeon. You know, he he worked in a he he his calls were all in little country churches where their salaries were, um, you know, they along with his little salary he got chickens and vegetables kind of thing. One of those guys, and but he was the father and grandfather of a rather large extended family of the congregation. Now this guy was an extremely flawed individual. I mean, he had been disinvited from, a, from conference meetings because of his really, really negative legalistic approach to scriptures and toward colleagues, especially women colleagues. And he felt it was necessary to interpose himself in the ministries of that congregation. It got so bad, eventually I had to get the bishop invited. It was Bishop Rimbo at the time. The pastor's refrain was 
constantly, I have freedom in Christ. I have freedom in Christ, basically to do whatever I want. And Bishop Rimbo responded, I'll never forget, he said, Jerry, your freedom has turned into license. Now, I bring up this little story as a counter-illustration to what the apostle says. When Paul says we are really the most free when we become slaves to one another. Well, then the question then becomes, well, if all the good news of Christ does is to make us slaves to what, each other, then in what sense are we really free? Well, Martin Luther made those same points. In his book entitled, appropriate, appropriately enough, The Freedom of a Christian, he wrote, a Christian is perfectly free, Lord, perfectly free, Lord, subject to no one. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. In other words, to be free in the Christian sense means that you are basically everybody's slave. According to Luther, it is through faith that the Christian has been united to Christ, like a bride to her bridegroom. We've been married to Christ. And in any good marriage, that means we share everything in common. In other words, basically, it's all kind of community property. It's like there's an old story about how, how a husband and wife were discussing their living wills. And the husband said, you know, just so you know, I would never want to live in a vegetative state. You know, depending on some machine and fluids from a bottle. If I ever get into that state, I want you just to pull the plug. And the wife thought about it for a minute. And then she got up, unplugged the TV, and threw out his beer. Okay, so, what does Christ bring to the marriage? Well, he brings his death and his resurrection. He brings his conquest over sin and death and meaninglessness. He brings righteousness and holiness into our marriage with him. They are all ours now. Nothing, not our sin, not our insecurities, not our doubts, not our inferiority complexes, not our arrogance, not even death can conquer us now. We are all free, free from those anxieties. God affirms us. God sets us free. Even the doubts and fears about ourselves and about the future, they don't matter anymore. Because those doubts and those fears ultimately cannot defeat us. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has conquered all of them. All of them for us. Now, of course, this doesn't mean we're free from all temptations, right? I mean, we're tempted sometimes. Tempted to doubt tempted to do bad things, tempted to wonder about life and whether it is all that good. I mean, we are tempted, right? I know I am. But having such, such temptations are not signs of a weak faith. To the contrary, it's when you don't have temptations and doubts. That's when you ought to worry. To be a Christian is to live a life filled with temptations and doubts. So in other words, we got them, but ultimately we are free from them. They simply don't stand a chance against our bridegroom Christ and the family inheritance that he has given us. Nothing, nothing, not even our doubts about God or our failure to keep the commandments or our fear of death or our insecurities can harm or condemn us because you and I are truly, really, and ultimately free. Oh yeah, it's great to be free, but, get in. but again, we are not free to just kind of do our own thing. Again, as Paul says, we are still slaves to each other. And freedom from, freedom from the law doesn't mean that we should totally neglect God's law. The commandments are still to be taught. They still have a role as our disciplinarian or tutor, condemning us to our sin. You know, when we get a little bit too, uh, in the Southern Ohio word, a little bit too uppity to remember our sin, to think that free, the freedom we have is something we gained without Christ. See, you and I, we need the commandments to set us straight, to keep us on a straight path when we start acting and thinking that way. However, if these, these legalities 
interfere with our doing the Christ-like thing to another? Well, it is then that we are free from keeping the law. You see, in those cases, because we are slaves to our neighbor and we have been called to serve our neighbor, and when keeping the law would get in the way of, of such a service, then we're obligated to disobey the law. Don't take my word for it. That's coming from Paul and coming from Luther. Paul says that the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, to love our neighbors as ourselves. But when you are loving your neighbor as yourself, well, then you have for, for fulfilled that law. But suppose one of the, lo- the loving thing requires you to break the, one of those biblical laws. Could you ever imagine a situation where you to protect someone, you, maybe you had to hurt somebody else, or you had to lie in order to protect, protect a friend's reputation, where you might have to fail to keep the Sabbath in order to take care of a member of your family. In those situations, by breaking the biblical law, you are, of course, sinning. But the higher mandate of love might demand that you break one of those commandments in order to serve in love. Or as Martin Luther put it, since all law exists to promote law, to, to promote love, law must cease where it is in conflict with love. If you are a Christian, you have the power to dispense with all the commandments so far as they hinder you in the practice of love. Luther reminds that, that reminds us that Christian love can be sensitive to situations and not rule bound. And Paul basically says the same thing, too. In verses 22 and 23, Paul lists the fruits of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and gentleness and self-control. He says that there's no law against such things. We don't need the Ten Commandments to guide us to living Christian life. No, the Holy Spirit teaches us how to love, we, and when the Holy Spirit is fully within us, well, then we simply cannot help ourselves but to love one another. And when we are really, truly being our true Christian selves, you know, the kind of person that God created in our baptisms, we can't help but to serve our neighbors. I mean, we are just dying to do it. You know, Martin Luther saw an analogy between living the Christian life and being in love with a spouse. When he, in a 1520 treatise, he wrote, quote, It is further follows that from this that a Christian man living in faith has no need of a teacher of good works. But he does whatever the occasion calls for. We can see that in an everyday example. When a husband and wife really love one another, have pleasure in each other, and thoroughly believe in their love, well, who teaches them how to behave to one another? So you and I don't want somebody to give you a set of laws for instructing you on how to love your spouse, right? Or relate to your parents, or how to relate to your other friends, or even how to love yourself. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? Because when you love them, when you truly love them, then you know what to do. You just know it. So my family of faith, go and live freely for peace of mind and joy and good works will take care of themselves. So be free, my friends in Christ. Be free. For in love, Christ has truly set you free. Amen.